Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. I hope you had a beautiful weekend. Thank you so much for all your messages and opinions around last week's episode as well as past episodes. If you enjoy this podcast, you'll probably enjoy other podcasts on jewishcoffeehouse.com. Few things I want to mention before we get started. Number one, I am a podcast success coach. I help people who are just starting with their podcasts as well as people who are already podcasting and want to streamline their process or grow their audience or monetize their podcast. If you or anyone you know is looking for these services, please do not hesitate to make an introduction. Number two, there is this new initiative called Rate My Bate Din. I will post the link in the show notes. And this is an initiative done by Ora and Chochmat Nashim. I'm curious to know what you think. Is this a good thing or not a good thing? I also want to comment on last week's shooting in Texas, which was awful. Not sure we want to go into politics here, but definitely we can do it on the Francisco Show discussion group on WhatsApp. The link is in the show notes. And lastly... I don't know if you've heard, but last week I posted on my stories about the molestation case, a Rebbe in Israel who allegedly molested at least 15 five- and six-year-olds in a gun. This is just so tragic and horrific. I'd love to hear from you what great ideas and strategies we have to create safer spaces for our children and how to better educate our children to detect unsafe behaviors. And of course, if you or someone you know wants to come on and share their story, we do have the No More Silence series available to you or anyone you're close with who would like to come on and talk about their personal story of abuse. Okay, I hope you enjoy this episode and stick around until the end to see what's coming up next week. Welcome back to The Francisca Show. Today we have yet another episode with a listener who is brave enough to come onto the show and talk about her personal struggles and experiences. And the topic for today is choosing mental health over having children right now. So welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll go into more of the conversation that this conversation inspired, which a lot of it had to do with the birth control panel and then the financial episode on the discussion group. We had a lot of conversation around capability of having children and when do you get a heter and what are the dynamics? And then you offered your experience as a new perspective, dynamics that may impact a family's decision. So the mic is yours. Let's get started. All right. I'm a special ed teacher, and I live in Manhattan, though I am from a community not in the tri-state area, and I have a fantastic husband. We've been married for nearly five years, and I have my students. I teach in public school, so I have 25 kids, but don't have any kids of my own. And why is that? So if for right now, there's a lot of different factors. One of them is mental illness. So I have just for the laundry list, I have anxiety, depression, ADHD, OCD, PTSD, and body dysmorphia that sometimes edges into actual eating disorder. And it goes in waves. There have been times, even times in my marriage, where things have been going well and we've been considering the possibility of going down on my medicines enough to have children. But right now it's at a peak and has been for a while. And so that's much influencing my decision or our decision to not have children right now. It's been a really rough couple of years for me. Both of my parents died fairly soon, one after another. The pandemic has been really tough. It just spiked my anxiety and that affected sleep. 
And for about two years, there were three nights that I slept through the night. In addition to that, one of the things that happens when I get anxious is that I get very easily overwhelmed. So put very easily overwhelmed and panic attacks with not sleeping. And it just made things very hard for me to function. I'm so sorry to hear about the passing of your parents. I cannot imagine what that's like for you. Cancer sucks. What can I say? Can you tell me a little bit about where you were holding before you got married in terms of your mental health? And tell us if you discussed this with your husband before you got married. Did you go to a rough to talk about postponing planning family life? What was all of that like? So we have a little bit of odd dating situation for people in the from community. We met in our first year of college, but we waited about three and a half years of dating before we got married. When we got married, we were already very, very close because we already knew each other really well. About four or five months in to dating, I was thinking that like, okay, this is getting more serious. Like I can't keep going if he doesn't know about my brain, which is the term that I use to encapsulate the positive sides of me, my creativity and everything, but also, which he had seen, but also the mental illness piece. So because of the laws of Yichud, we had this conversation walking in circles around the block where I was living at the time. And I explained, you know, gave him the laundry list, which at that point was shorter than it is now because things have come up. But I told him what I had, you know, the name calling, but then also what it looks like for me. And I was absolutely floored when he responded with, oh, I have some of those things too. So fairly early on in our dating, we knew each other's brains. We knew each other's mental illnesses, but also each other's strengths really well. And let's go back just one more step. What is your religious background? Did you grow up from and your husband as well? Both of us come from not originally totally from family. So both of our Mothers grew up conservative. His father grew up modern Orthodox, and my father grew up unaffiliated. But by the time we were both born, our families were entrenched in the modern Orthodox community. Did you go to a rabbi for Psak after you got married right away, or was it just assumed that you're not ready? So, in our Kala and Chatan classes, It was just assumed that we were going to be using birth control. Definitely explained the mental illness factors to my Kala teacher. I don't know 100% what happened with my husband's Chatan teacher, but it's also somebody who he's known for a long time. He probably knew some of the background, but it was just assumed that we were going to be on birth control. When the form of birth control that I was using, I was using the hormonal birth control pills and they were causing physical side effects that were affecting the way that I was responding to sex. So when I felt I had to switch to an IUD, then we consulted our Rav. Let's talk about your brain. Was there trauma involved that caused things to happen. As you said, you have more things now than you did when you got married and may assume that it has something to do with losing both of your parents. That is a massive traumatic thing, even though it might not be completely related. Is there a history and a past to everything evolved or is it like something you were born with? I know that I inherited the depression. Thanks, dad. So the PTSD is from experiences before that. The past couple of years have brought up more things. And when I say I developed some of these later, it's more that they were there, but recently in therapy, they've come up. Would you like to share some examples? So the 
PTSD that I have is from growing up with my family situation, specifically with my father's insistence on always being right and not having an out at that point to express myself the way that my body feels that it needs to. So now it's just a lot of work going back afterwards and talking about things and then talking to my former self about it. In terms of the sexual difficulties, that was not trauma related, but just about two and a half years into my marriage, I just started having major trouble with sex. It started actually from two different directions. One was just a mental block. It was hard for me to be touched. It just something in my brain wouldn't let that happen. And this is what I was referring to with the birth control pills that I was on were wearing away at my vaginal tissue. So any sort of friction was causing a lot of pain. And that's called vaginismus. Once we figured out that the problem was the birth control that I was on, so we wanted to switch it. And that was around getting the IUD was when I really started having a major connection with my post Thank you for sharing such a personal stuff about how all this affects you both mentally, physically, sexually. Based on the laundry list, as you mentioned, I am assuming there is medication involved, and you did mention some of that. Would you like to go through some of the implications and what it means to be on medication and how that may affect childbearing? Yeah, definitely. My medication is absolutely necessary. I have seen what happens on days where I forget it. It's very important at this point to keep myself stable and to keep myself able to function that I be taking psych meds. The problem with that in terms of starting a family is that a lot of the anti-anxiety, antidepressant medications work by suppressing the reuptake of certain chemicals in the brain, which is what I, as an adult human trying to function, I need those chemicals to stay put for longer so that my brain can actually use them. However, on a developing fetus, they can seriously impact brain development because things aren't flowing the way that they usually do. When I am at a stable enough point to go down on my medicine, I also have to be strategic in terms of which medicines to keep and which I need to go off of based on what's safe for a developing baby. I'm so happy we're doing this episode because there is so much stigma around mental health, around medication. So So let's go into that a little bit. Based on your information, knowledge, experience, I know there are some medications that are not a problem. If you want to start a family, let's talk about that. When I get to the point of being able to go down and when I get to the point of being stable enough mentally that I can deal with all the changes, hormonal changes, schedule changes, all the things that come along with having kids. When I get to the point where I feel that I'm ready for that, then the course that has been suggested to me is to go to a reproductive psychiatrist, which before this happened, I didn't even know such a field existed, but it's cool. Apparently, every year they come out with an updated list of which medicines are safe for pregnancy and nursing and which ones are not. And I have been told by my current psychiatrist that the list is getting longer, that it goes with 
more things being included in the safe list. But that's something when I once I get to that point, I will bring in another clinician to make sure that everything that I'm on is safe. That's hopeful to know that you don't have to get off of everything to be able to have kids physically. I guess that does help a little bit with the stigma. But what kind of things did you have to deal with or do you have to deal with when it comes to the choices that you have to make right now and how it looks on the outside? Do you, do you give everyone a rundown explanation? <laughs> I don't go around shouting it from the rooftops, but at the same time, I am very open about having mental illnesses and being on medication for them. So like when I was in college, I was part of an event that had like 250 people and it was called Stomp Out the Stigma by amazing organization called Active Minds that had a chapter at my university. And this event is like it says to stomp out stigma. And so I spoke very frankly about my brain in front of about 250 people and a video camera. So that was terrifying at the time, but an amazing experience. And recently, I went on a mental health podcast to tell my story and that I left out the sexual and having kids part and did that using my name and sharing it. But because this is a little bit more sensitive, I'm keeping that to myself for now. Makes sense. Do you live in a firm community? And what's it like for you emotionally? To be in our religion and community in general is very pro having babies and family life. What's it like being a family without children yet? I live in a large Jewish community and I have friends who are younger than me, got married after me and have one, two, three kids. And for a while, I felt like I had, enter air quotes, an excuse because first there was Shana Rishona and then I was in grad school, but I graduated in December. And so now I'm kind of like, because I also, I had in mind that doing a full-time job plus part-time grad school plus having children was too much. My post agreed, but at this point, so I don't have that quote excuse anymore, but for the sake of my mental health, which is health, just like any other health, it's not safe at this point for me to have the hormonal vicissitudes of pregnancy, the changes in schedule, the changes in hormones, emotions, all the things that go along with having a baby. It is difficult, but I also, I have some friends who got married at the same time and don't have kids for various reasons. And mostly we are part of our community to an extent that people just accept us for being us rather than for, wait a minute, they don't have kids yet. They've been married for a while. What's going on? But that's my perception. It's possible that people are thinking that, but I wouldn't know. I'm not in their heads. And how do you feel about it personally? So we spoke about the psak or the religious aspect of it. We spoke about the communal aspect. What about yourself, you and your husband as a marriage? We both grew up babysitting. I have relatives and friends who the husband of the couple hadn't held baby before it was on the horizon that they were going to have a baby. I know my father was like that, that, you know, my mother babysat, but he tutored. So he worked with older kids, but both of us babysat. Thank God we have two nephews and a niece. We love spending time with them. At a certain point, like it's great to be 
at Becky, but I really want to be Ema. And that's really hard for me. So whereas before it was so, since I finished grad school, it's been more on our minds. Before then, it was great. I absolutely loved playing with my nephews and niece and just being there for them in the capacity of Nant. But now, even though it's not feasible for us at the moment, it's complicated. So as much as I love playing with them, if I'm in the moment playing with them and not in my head too much, which is a rare moment, but if I'm not too much in my head, then I really enjoy it. It's one of the things that calms me down. But if I start thinking about it too much, then I start realizing like, these aren't my kids. I can't have kids right now. I want kids right now. And so it's kind of a tightrope to walk. And what about your husband? Do you feel like you're failing him? Do you feel like there's a date, an expiration date to how long he's going to put up with this? I'm asking questions. I'm just pushing a little bit. Yes, that is definitely something that is on my mind. We both want kids, but we also want each other to be healthy and want each other to be okay with it. And he has his own things as well. So it's going to be difficult for both of us. We're both very dependent on sleep. The irony is my body doesn't naturally sleep. So that's going to be a major adjustment. But yeah, it's very hard to not feel like this is all my fault. And if he had married somebody else, he would have kids by now. Thank you for sharing that. Because it is at the core of women struggling with their identity because you feel like this is what we're meant to do or be able to do with our bodies at the point when it's the right time and the right scenario. But you can potentially be going through my body's failing me or my brain is failing me. And it's a major potentially identity crisis for a woman knowing that she's not able to do that right now. What words of advice or encouragement do you have for anyone who may be dealing with similar struggles? One thing that I'll say is, I have no idea. I wish I could comfort myself. But mainly something that I have been hearing for years in therapy and elsewhere is you're in your head. So everything in your head seems loud and present. Other people are not in your head and they're going about their lives. They're probably not thinking. They're probably not judging. It's not definite. It's very true. It's a lot about the fear that we have of what other people think. And the fear is usually much bigger than what you're actually dealing with. So Agreed. Yeah. One piece of advice that I did just think of that I can give is if you're in a situation where there's halacha involved, find a posik who is absolutely an expert. And that's something that I've said for a long time. Anybody can say no. It takes a gadol to say yes. But I'm finding throughout this journey more and more that the greater the rav and the more confidence they have in their psak, the more permissive they'll be in general. I know this isn't always the case, and halacha is always key and is always on the forefront of any psak that I've gotten. But our rav has allowed things for both of us that I definitely did not think that anybody in the modern orthodox, modern orthodox machmer sphere would say. So an example of that is that part of my, I'll say sexual journey for lack of a better term, or my journey through the negative sides in the last two and a half years, that at this point, I'm getting a little bit better about like being hugged without being asked first, 
which two years ago was definitely off the table. It's like anytime my husband touched me, he had to ask. So I'm getting a little bit better at that. But at this point, anything and the body dysmorphia eating disorder part plays into this as well. But it's very hard for me to be unclothed around my husband and feel comfortable about myself. It's hard for me to be unclothed around myself and feel comfortable about myself. So one of the things, like because there's no intercourse happening, is that our Rev, who I'm going to say is a very prominent and respected Rev in our community and also in other places. He has a lot to do with affiliations with a bunch of different organizations. So he's not just in my community. I happen to be blessed that he is part of my community. He's a name that people may recognize in the modern Orthodox, modern Orthodox Mahmer sphere. One of the things that he has given a heter for is for my husband to engage in solo sex. And that to the end of letting me work through what I need to work through in therapy so that I don't have this crushing guilt of look at all these things that I'm preventing my husband from doing. I just want to thank you for going all all the way there. Well, hopefully it's not just uncomfortable, but it's a relief to be able to share it and get it off your chest. Maybe I'm wrong. I've found for myself and have experienced both with my husband and with friends is really there's at this point the world is opening up more and I know should is a word that doesn't mean much but there shouldn't be stigma associated if you're going through something that's that feels too tough for you to go through it on your own find professionals who are experts being in therapy I will say I've been in therapy for 11 out of the last 14 years. And right now I have my personal therapist, my individual sex therapist, and our couple's sex therapist, as well as my psychiatrist. So really, I'm a big proponent of therapy, and it can help with a lot of different things. And if you feel like you're in a situation where you're stuck, definitely you have my endorsement in there being no shame in reaching out for help. Are there any closing remarks? One thing, I'm kind of saying this to myself as I'm saying it to other people, is our community can be very cookie cutter at times. And just being your authentic self is, you know, we feel like we have to fit into a mold get married, have kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I definitely feel like there's a mold that I'm supposed to fit into. But really, you have to do what's best for you. And at this point, what's best for me is not necessarily what's best for other people. For other people who might be struggling with things, mental illness, it's super common, like one in four to one in five depends which statistic you happen to be reading at the time. But I know that there are other reasons for people not to want to or not to be able to have children. I guess what I'll say is surround yourself with people who raise you up. I wouldn't be here without the support of my family, especially my sister, my husband, my mother-in-law, who's phenomenal. I think that If you surround yourself with people who accept you for being you, then you can kind of shed the expectations in a way and be somewhat just content being yourself while still trying to improve. It's so beautiful how you described it. And I'm so happy for you that you do have that family support and that you do have a very precious relationship with your mother-in-law. I know so many people suffer with their relationships with their mothers-in-law, but everyone has their little pekala, as they say, of challenges. And you definitely were so generous to talk about yours with us today. Thank you, Becky. Thank you.
if anyone wants to reach out to Becky directly, I'm happy to make the introduction. And hopefully this helps with releasing shame, stigma, judgment around, first of all, people who feel like they need to ask for that sock or need to get that extra support to go for that and get it. And to also be less assuming of other people who may not have children for medical reasons, for brain or mental health reasons. And I know people don't talk about this, but for financial reasons, even though it's not a valid reason to get a PSOC, but that is a reason people end up choosing to use birth control. So thank you for coming on today. Good luck with your journey. I hope you are able to build a family in the future and find all that you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end. We'll do something different this week. If you'd like to join the discussion group on WhatsApp, the link is in the show notes. I will be posting a few options for you to help me decide what should come out next week. We have some incredible episodes in the queue, and I don't know which one should come out first. Join us there to continue the conversation, and thank you so much for all your support. Whether you're anonymous or not, we really appreciate you supporting the show, and here are some ways you can support the show. Number one. I am a podcast success coach and I help people launch, grow, and monetize their podcast. So if that's something you or someone you know needs help with, please do make an introduction. Another great way to support the show is by listening, following on your favorite podcast app, sharing this with a friend. And of course, if you would like to financially support the show, you can send in sponsorships or donations. I really appreciate you. This is how you support the work that I do. Hope you have a great week. See you next time.